What's up? What's up? I hope everybody is good. Welcome back to the Negative BQ channel. I am BQ. This is your Impact Lounge against all odds review for 2024. I thought they put on a pretty good show with against all odds. I don't think I got the opportunity to really take it in the way many of you did because I watched Impact right before it. And five hours of wrestling is a lot for me. I've, I've told you guys many times I cannot watch that much wrestling in a row. I mean, I can't really watch anything like that in a row. Um, so by the time it was kind of halfway through the show, I was pretty tired. But uh, I did recognize that it was a very good show. The crowd was incredible in Chicago. So shout out to my old home state of Illinois. Even though Illinois, if, if you're, if you ever been there, say, okay, I'm going to go back to my actual home state of California. If you're from Northern California, you know that, or if you're from Southern California, either way, you know that it's like two different states. That's, that's the way California is treated. Illinois is like really, really similar, actually. Us in Southern Illinois are almost like Missouri, you know, but uh, I still got, still got love for uh, the people in Chicago. They, they really came out. They uh, they provided an atmosphere that was really reminiscent of some old TNA. You know, they were just very raucous, very into it. Just a great electric atmosphere. And the show looked great as well. They, the lighting looked good. Um, you know, I, I communicated to you guys in my last review when I, after talking to some people at TNA, is that the perception was that Scott Demore wanted to make this show better and Anthem didn't, where... It was really kind of the inverse where Anthem's pretty committed to making this look like a nationally televised wrestling show to where Scott, while probably wanted it to, just wasn't taking the necessary direction. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that the show is going to start looking better here, um, incrementally better going forward. And this was a great start because uh, against all odds, it did look very good. It sounded very, very good. And uh, you know the wrestling up and down was great, and I just wish the the weekly show was a little was a was a better representation of how good these monthly shows typically are, because we get you know we just get some angles whether it's bad comedy or just bad television um, on the weekly show that again is not um, it's not a representation of how good these whether it's the Impact Plus shows or the pay per views. It's just not a good representation of how those how good those are, but uh, yeah. But the venue the venue looked great. They were um, it was very very well lit up. So we've been asking for this for a long time. We had blue ropes. Um, I'm all I'm all for changing the ropes, but I think uh, not the ring apron, but the mat. I think you got to change that up too, uh, to just to make to make the colors look a, look a little bit better. They kind of keep the same mat. But they change a ring, ring apron and ropes, and sometimes uh, the colors don't really jive. Before I get into this card, I'm going to fast forward here a little bit. We're going to talk about Ash by Elegance, and I'm she is officially branded Ash by Awful Sauce on this podcast, on this channel. There has been no bigger supporter of Ash than me since January. I have said I'm a fan of hers. I've been a fan of hers. I'm giving this gimmick an opportunity. I'm giving it a chance. I'm giving it a long leash. I'm going to give them an opportunity to figure it out. And they had their opportunity at against all odds. And it was fumbled so freaking badly that I'm out. I'm out, out, out on Ash. I said I wasn't going to be out. I'm out. And it's not on. it's not against her. It's definitely not against the personnel concierge because he does he's done a pretty good job since the very beginning. But the whole presentation, the whole, you know, my my level of give a shit is no longer there for Ash. I I, I don't buy her as a credible threat, a credible challenger. I don't care about the match. And I tried my hardest to stick around, folks. I did. I, I really kind of got on here. And even though I pointed out some of the bad that she was doing, I was still kind of defending it. Let's give it a chance. You know, they're doing a slow burn here. I'm always asking for a slow burn. I'm, I'm so out. And let me explain to you why. We have gone through damn near six months of her sitting ringside for title matches. She hasn't got involved. Jordan hasn't even really acknowledged this woman 
with the exception of NXT Battleground, uh, when she came down and she hit her with the belt, you would think, based off that, that there was going to be some kind of retaliation angle by Ash on this show. And it almost seemed like there was going to be. The match is over. Ash runs into the ring. She's barefoot. The crowd responds to this. Okay? I'm not going to say they popped, because pop is a strong word. They responded like, oh shit, we're going to get a brawl. Ash goes in, hits her with her bedazzled knuckles in the leg. Jordan damn near no-sells this thing. Within five seconds, she is whooping Ash by Elegance's ass, Ash by Al- Awful Sauce, whooping her ass, and then within five more seconds, they're doing bad comedy on the outside. Now, there's been a lot of bad comedy with this gimmick. They could have erased almost all of that if Ash jumped in the ring and laid a vicious beat down on Jordan Grace. Like she finally was getting in the ring, getting her hands on her. She should be pissed because Jordan just hit her with the belt the week before. She should have come in, attacked from behind. She had a weapon, should have beat the absolute piss out of her. And now you have some heat going into this match. And you can, uh, you can again erase a lot of that bad comedy. She lays a vicious beat down and then is kind of like vicious going forward up until Slammiversary. Now, we don't know that that's going to be the match. We've just assumed this for a very long time. The way that this was laid out was that they're changing course. That they're just going to write... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say write her off TV, but it was it was presented like they were changing course where Jordan got one over on her and they're going to move on to something else. That's how it came off. But I don't think that's what they're doing. I said on my impact review when I was talking about some impact, some some inside TNA stuff. Artie Evans was one of the this was one of his babies, the Ash by Elegance gimmick. The character. The the belief backstage is that the gimmick has become the personal concierge. I had said that from the very, very, very beginning when he, when they first showed up on screen and he spoke. I said they have to be. Be careful that he is not the gimmick. He has become the gimmick. He does all the talking. She does none. She has no connection with the people. She had an opportunity to get some real freaking heat from a real energized crowd. And they would have booed her out of the arena. if She just laid this the beatdown of all beatdowns on Jordan Grace. So I don't care if this next episode of Impact... Ash comes with a chair, a table, a a, a chainsaw, a flamethrower, a gun. I don't care what she does. There is nothing she can do for me as a viewer that I'm going to buy as any real heat because that was the opportunity to do it. It was completely, the bag was completely freaking fumbled. So I, I don't care what she does going forward. I'm out. I'm out, 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 out. There is nothing they can do that I... Nothing is a strong word, but right now I feel like there's nothing they can do that is going to make me have any interest in this match to buy it as a legitimate competition. There's there's no heat whatsoever. You know, Jordan got pretty much sneak attacked and still put ash on her ass. And when I said that they made it bad comedy was, you know, she poured the champagne on her and she's yelling, my eyes, I'm blind or whatever it is. What, what are they doing? I I am trying to do a much better job of saying, hey, let's give it a couple of weeks. Let's see what direction they're going with it. Man, I, I just not. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out, out, out. Out. Let's get into these other matches here. We got Steve Macklin and Mike Santana taking on the Rascals. This was a great opener. The crowd was really, really into it It started off with some real heat in the ring the rascals are a little rehearsed they're not as bad as the motor city machine guns and i don't mean bad like bad i just mean the way they lay out their matches are clearly very rehearsed the the guns to me were a lot worse about that so that takes me out of matches as a fan a little bit but whatever um santana and steve macklin win this thing Mike Santana's cool. Steve Macklin's pretty cool, too. 
the reason I bring this up is that so wrestling as a whole is very uncool. A lot of the wrestlers are not cool. The people who run it are not cool. The fans are not cool. Okay. It doesn't mean uh, it's okay to have like a nerdy geek out thing. Everyone, everyone needs that. Some people it's anime, you know, trying to think what else. Some, Some people it's video games. Some people it's wrestling. That's fine. But if you look back at, you know, the attitude era, wrestling was, was very cool. And that's how people really got into it. The reason I'm even bringing this up is that I was scrolling on Facebook a couple days ago. I come across a Orange Cassidy headline, and he said, we want AEW to be the, the cool place, the cool wrestling company. And I was thinking about it, like, well, Orange Cassidy isn't cool. Tony Khan is not cool. Uh, the Young Bucks are not cool. There's some people who can portray themselves as kind of cool because they're on television. But if we're just, you know, really very few people in this world are, are like, cool. Got that, like, coolness mm-hmm. a, a, about them. It's a very small percentage. So I'm just like, well, well, these people are not cool. So you can't just manufacture a cool product without cool people and without cool wrestlers. I know I'm saying cool a lot. The Attitude Era had that. Um, Guys like Mike Santana it ha- has a cool factor about him. Steve Macklin does too, not to the not to the extent of of uh, Santana, but he does. And it, it just kind of got me thinking, man. If if, if TNA can find um, a way to factor more people like that into their show, I think that could help with with, with growing the audience a little bit, because. I kind of grew up as a as a kid where maybe wrestling also wasn't cool, but but you kind of just like looked up to who you saw on screen. You kind of wanted to to be them. And when the wrestlers look like us, I just I don't know. I think you just you you don't grow. I don't I don't I just think there's no growth in feeling like I can get in the ring. You know what I mean? Like I can compete with these dudes not at my age probably but i just mean like physically like hey i, I look like that dude I, I've, I've told you guys i take I've, I've taken pictures with wrestlers like where i'm i'm bigger than them you know um so i'm one of those guys like i like to see my my wrestlers on tv you know tall muscles look like the badasses like they can hurt somebody and i get that with steve macklin and i get that with santana and i would love to just see you know, TNA find a way to tap into more of that and to have just more of those kind of wrestlers on their roster to where we just kind of like, we want to be those guys. We kind of look up to them a little bit, you know? So um, as far as where they're going with this going forward, my concern was that this was just going to be a wrestling match, which it was. Because I think I, I was saying this on my, I don't remember what impact review, if it was the last one or the one before. I think it was the one two weeks ago is that when you start making things about wrestling, I mean, these these are not stories. You're making it about two guys saying, hey, if we beat this team in a wrestling match, they're never going to bother us again, and then we can have a one-on-one wrestling match. Like, that's that's not compelling to me. Just because the Rascals lost, what, they're never going to attack these guys again? They're never going to bother these guys again? They didn't, you know, they said, hey, let's take care of the Rascals, one and done. I like the one and done terminology because that's like cool terminology. You know what I'm saying? Like that's something in the basketball world that is used very, very often uh, from call, you know, someone who goes to college for one year and then goes to the NBA after that. They're always, you know, they're one and done. So Mike Santana is very tapped into, um, you know, current lingo. So he he's a very big asset to this company, but they just made it about, hey, we beat these two guys in a wrestling match. They're never going to bother us again. Now we can go have a wrestling match. Like that's just not, that's not compelling to me. I was, I was really curious how this was going to get laid out. I was like, is Santana going to kind of turn on him? Is 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 uh, is uh, Macklin going to turn on him? No. Now the match was great. I enjoyed it, but I'm just saying, creatively, 
I don't want to just see Macklin and Santana have a wrestling match. We've seen him have a couple of wrestling matches already. Then they had a wrestling match with the Rascals. Now they're going to go have another wrestling match. Like, I understand it's pro wrestling. <laughs> so, you, you know, wrestling is one of the key words in that. But we are talking about engaging storylines. It just has to be about more than more than that. Matt Hardy cuts a promo after this, letting us know that, you know, the, tonight's match with Moose is going to be broken rules, no rules, and Anything goes, like Jim Cornette would say, lazy booking. After this is Rich Swan versus PCO. AJ Francis is in the ring with a Scotty Pippen jersey, and he's getting heat. They're shut, shut the fuck it, fucking up him. I can't. What am I trying to say? They're shut, shut the f up. They're chanting, shut the fuck up. <laughs> um, I'm not one of the people under the belief that Scotty Pippen was the reason Jordan was successful. I know there's a, a contingent of sports fans that believe that. I'm not one of them. I, I don't feel that had S- Scotty Pippen never arrived, that Jordan would be some freaking bottom feeder in the league who never got out of the first round of the playoffs and never won a championship. I'm not under that belief at all. The um, I actually kind of like this match. You know, guy, I'm not a PCO guy, but I am, I am a Rich Swan guy. He was half of the equation here, so I was able to get into it. I thought what was a little bit annoying was the constant basketball references that the announcers were doing. Like they were trying to be funny. They were trying to pop each other. A couple of them were humorous. A couple were kind of, uh, you know, they were like original. They had a couple jabs. Okay, whatever. But it it almost felt like it wasn't going to stop. They just kind of kept going back and forth. And I, I've, I've, I'm trying to do my best to not hammer the commentary because I've been doing that for so many years with Josh Matthews and Don Callis and uh, D'Lo Brown and Matt Stryker. And, you know, even when they had Sanjay Dutt at one point and Madison Rain, I've been, I, w- I rode those people for so many years. I'm, I'm trying not to do that with these guys, even though I'm, talking about first time ever matchup and a kick out. And yeah, I, I do that jokingly. I'm trying my hardest. I, I really am. Matthew Raywall in the first match is impartial. The next match, he is cracking jokes with Tom Hannafin. The next match, we'll get to it here in a second, System versus the Nemeth Brothers. He's a full-blown heel. And then the next match, he's a baby face. I mean, and then and then after that, Ali versus Trent, full-blown heel. Get this guy off commentary, for real. Uh, but again, Steve, uh, Steve Francis, going back to the NBA days here. AJ Francis and, um, excuse me, not, it wasn't AJ Francis in the match. Rich Swan and PCO, it was cool. This was put together. PCO wins the match. We knew he was going to win. This was put together. It was strictly an excuse to get PCO on the show, which there's always an excuse to get PCO on the show. They, it's There's rarely a creative angle to get PCO involved in anything. It's just there's always some excuse for PCO. This was, this was an excuse to get him on the show so that they could do the angle with Steph DeLander. And Steph Double D Lander comes down, playing to the crowd, and talking about, should I say no? Should I say yes? So she's dragging this out for what seemed like 45 minutes. She said yes. She's going to go on, an, on a date with PCO. And I'm hoping this is leading to, I don't know how long Matt Cardona is out. I'm hoping it's leading to him jumping this thing and attacking and beating the shit out of him. I did not want to see a date. Oh, again, I wasn't against the angle. I didn't want to see a date of PCO and, and, and Steph Double D Lander on screen. Maybe it would be entertaining. I don't know. Once upon a time, Laurel Van Ness and, and Braxton Sutter were doing dates on TV, and I, I, I thought they were kind of funny. Maybe this will be good. I don't think it's going to be, but you know, we'll see. But this, um, this is just really weird. It's it, it's just really weird. We'll see though. Um, 
the system takes on the Nemeth brothers. And again, Matt, Matt Raywall now is a full-blown heel for this match. Alicia gets ejected. And, um, I, I, you know, this was a pretty good match. I thought, um, I said this on my Impact review that when Ryan Nemeth comes out with Nick, it looks like it's bring your brother to work day. Ryan does not have the charisma, the ring, the the, the promo ability, the in ring, nothing like his brother. But I'm open to seeing him grow in this company and to get an opportunity and to be someone we care about. I don't dislike the dude at all. I'm just I'm just pointing out he definitely has not none of that that his brother has. But uh, I, I'm 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 interested to see his growth. I actually thought the Nemeth brothers were going to win this match. Um, I, I'm, I'm sometimes there's just things that, that happen on the show where I'm like, are they going to pull the plug on the system? There's, there's, there's just some things here or there. And I thought there was a, a chance that the Nemeth brothers were going to win this thing. And they, they didn't. So dirty Dango comes out. This was probably one of the low points of the show because it didn't make any sense. And it wasn't like he came out at the end. He he was there the entire match just hanging out. And he's just wearing like white shorts. Like he's almost, he's damn near Jake something it. Something. I'm trying to make up words, by the way. Something it. Where he's out there half naked. Dressed like he's going to compete. And um, he ultimately helps cost the Nemeth brothers the match. The system wins. And they're they're attempting to tell this story here that there's a history between Dango and Nick Nemeth. Like I'm trying to think what they'll have. I, I saw Dango's entire WWE run. Not in, entire. I didn't see the fashion police shit, but I, I saw the majority of his run. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know for again, going back to making excuses for people to wrestle. I don't I don't know what the history is with these guys. I don't have a freaking clue. So you, someone may have to smarten me up if there's really any kind of history there. But it was very random. It almost it almost looked like he was joining the system, which I don't think he is. But it was it was it was odd. And uh, you know, Dango's been off screen for a little while now. But I thought it was reported last year that he resigned. So I was like expecting him to to resurface. But this this was. This just seems so out of place, but I'm interested to see what they're doing. ABC interview backstage. I don't know if they're breaking these guys up or not. Just because it's a taped show, you 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 get a certain angle, and then they can course correct. Very, you know, they can course correct for the next set of tapings. But it's kind of like it, it's confusing, and. I don't know if this is like a slow burn or if they're changing their mind on it because now these guys are getting along great. Then it shows Jordan Grace getting stitches there a week later, a week after her match with Roxanne Perez. Now she is getting stitched up. Frankie Kazarian takes on Joe Hendry. This was another excuse to get these guys on the show. But it, but as I said, you can be a little random uh, for TNA+. Plus. Frank Gazarian takes on Joe Hendry. Matt Raywall is back to being a baby face for, for this match on commentary. He was a full-blown heel five minutes before this. He is a baby face again. This was a the match was good because these guys can work and they have size. The the finish was awful. The idea was there. It was the execution. I had to rewind this thing three or four times. Because all I saw was Joe Hendry deliver a back suplex and Frankie Gazarian roll over for the pin. I had to watch this a few times. And, you know, Frankie um, had some brass knuckles or something that he, he pulled out of his shorts. It was enough to get him the win. It wasn't enough to knock Jordan Grace down later in the evening, but it was enough for Frankie to get the win. And I was curious what where they were going to go here as far as who was going to win the match because Frankie has a great gimmick going. He keeps losing. Joe Hendry has a good thing going. Shouldn't be losing. I think some people were upset that he did lose here. But of course, they um, you know, they protected him because it, it, it wasn't a clean finish. So they're going to go back to, to, to wrestling again. 
And I don't know what it is. It's it's this company. It's every company. Like no one wants to get heat on the heels. It, it's kind of like what I was, ex, you know, um, explaining earlier with the Ash stuff. Frankie Gazarian wins the match. He cheats. You know, whoops on on uh, Joe Hendry a little bit. Ace Steel comes out like he's with no sense of purpose. Like he's getting ready to walk across the street and ask the neighbor for a cup of sugar. But he comes out, and I almost thought for a second he was going to join up with Frankie Gazarian. Like I thought maybe he was going to turn on on Joe Hendry, which is a super rare, random pairing, by the way. But instead, they go for the babyface pop because he's from Chicago, so he lays out Frankie Gazarian. Instead of Frankie Gazarian leaving with any kind of heat from this raucous crowd, if he would have beat down Joe Hendry and freaking Ace Steel. So Frankie gets the win, but leaves with no heat. Ali takes on Trent seven pounds overweight. Um, after this, this is this is a match they were building to for a while. Matt Raywall is a heel again. The goof, they got the goof ref on, on work in this match. Frank the goof, and they're announcing the wrestlers. They, you know, she, they announce Trent seven pounds overweight and um you know uh he is so committed to, re- to to being overweight because i have i saw images of him the other day and and you know i think it was like nxt uk like he was thin like this dude he's on that like eddie edwards sammy callahan diet but anyway as they're getting ready to announce mustafa ali because they're in chicago the crowd is all about this dude. So in an attempt to get heat on Ali, which the, the fans the fans have not even been... Uh, the babyface has been winning the matches so far. Frankie Gazarian didn't win, but they didn't. he didn't leave with heat. So the fans have not been booing anything up to this point, okay? So they're expected... They've, they've been conditioned to cheer for everything. So in an attempt... To get heat, which it didn't work, because again, the fans have been cheering all night. They're not, not they're not gonna boo now. Trent, number seven with a coke, cuts him off and says the cameras were still rolling after your interview the other day. Which the cameras were in a different room. It wasn't the room he was interviewed in. So you just have the the, the camera rolling in the other room too. For no reason. It just so happens to be on. Anyway, Ali goes in the room with Singh, and we have the monthly production issues, the audio issues that I tell you, I, I, I tell you guys happen every single month. And then I get people in my comments, no, it's not every month. It is. Okay? One way or another. It might be something minor. It might be of how, how an angle, I'm not saying it's an entire show. It might be how a certain match looks or sounds. There is something every single month. And they tried to play this audio over the loudspeaker, and there was echo, there was feedback, it sounded like crap. I had no idea what was being said. I had to post in an Impact Lounge engagement group on Facebook and say, what the fucking hell is going on here? And they tried, you know, at least I'm not even from Chicago. I guess he's dissing the fans there. They tried. It didn't work. They're, they're, um, Channing, we still love you. They're still behind Ali for this match. I mean, bless their freaking heart. But Trent, all have a number seven with a pie, is also not really over. He's not someone, he hasn't been winning matches. He's not, he's not someone that people are naturally cheering for. You know, they might give him a, you know, cheer a little bit because he's a baby face, but there's, he doesn't have fans in the arena. You don't, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I I appreciate what they try to do here. It didn't work. Again, the crowd that has been cheering any everything all night. You're not going to stop now to boo Ali because of this angle. Now, if you had Frankie Gazarian 15 minutes before this getting heat, maybe maybe the the crowd would have been in the the mindset of hey, we're booing right now. I I don't know, but I I do I do admire that they tried. It it didn't work, and if um, Trent Seven was a little more over. Maybe it would have worked. 
but like no one wants to hear Trent Seven get on the microphone and talk. You know, he's like, you know, he grabs the mic and he said, "You you people from Chicago got to hear this." It it was um, it was okay. They but also the way they laid out this match. Who knows who the agent was? Trent Seven hit two of his finishers. Okay, Ali kick the the seven star lariat and the. Uh, the Birmingham, like he, he hit two of his biggest moves. Ali kicked out of both of them. If you're trying to get Ali to be booed in this match, why is he kicking out of Trent Seven's biggest uh, offensive moves? I'm not a, I'm not in the wrestling industry, but are you going to tell me that doesn't make sense? Ali obviously wins. We've known this forever uh, that he was going to win this match, and that they're going to move on to him and Mike Bailey. Frankie Kazarian is backstage ups- upset about the ace steel thing. Runs into Santino, who happens to be right there, and they make a fucking Chicago street fight for the television tapings. Street fight, street fight, street fight. No DQ, no rules, anything goes. No holds barred. Excuse me for that. Then we got the ABC versus EY, Eric Young, and Josh. They are uh, back to joking on commentary and cutting jokes after Gray Wall was a full-blown heel. I don't enjoy babyface versus babyface matches. That's what this was here. Ace Austin and um, Chris Bay wrestled each other a couple weeks ago, and I, I wasn't into it. I thought it was really slow and plotting, and uh, I wasn't into the story that they were attempting to, to tell. I thought they were going to like go balls to the wall and go at it, and that's not what this that was. That's not what this was either. Like this was just slow, and it just never, it never got there for me. Where I'm like, okay, this is some really good shit. This is some good action. I mean, it's it's four guys who can work. I just never got into it. At one point, Josh and um, might have been Chris Bay grabbed each other's nuts which really was out of place. I mean, that was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen them have Josh Alexander do on this show. It was really, really mid card for your, for your top guy. So I don't, I don't know what that was about. Why they thought that was like a good idea. Last time I saw that something like that was in Chicago, but Joey Ryan was in the match. It was the, uh, the call your shot gauntlet where they, they did like a, like a six or seven people in a conga line holding each other's nuts, you know, like this, that's kind of how this, this came off. Um, the ABC got the win here, which was really, really surprising. So are they getting them back on track? This was probably the most random match on this entire thing, but ABC needed this win. They're either going to break up or they're, and they're, they're like prolonging this thing, or they've changed their minds. I was watching this match and and I don't man now I wish I wrote it down. I kind of got I remember thinking, okay, I think I know what they're doing at Slam Anniversary. For the life of me, I can't think what it was. Oh, you know what it was? I was thinking at this point that they were gonna do a a tag team match of um the system versus ABC versus Josh and EY uh, a three way. I was thinking that. But by the end of the night, I kind of changed my mind on that. Jordan Grace has open challenges after this, and as I told you guys, I was told that there was no plans for anyone from NXT to come on the to be on screen anytime soon. But but then I also said if you watch the uh, episode where Jordan had her squash match and there she's walking around backstage and the women are coming and talk to her, it was pretty clear the ground was being laid for an NXT challenger. Now I was just thinking either it's going to be someone who wasn't teased like a gg dolan or something or it was going to be a standard open challenge maybe with someone from the roster and then someone from nxt afterwards would attack her possibly tatum paxley so they didn't swerve us at all here they tatum tatum paxley which is a horrible name answers the challenge and i mean there was no swerve like it, it was exactly the person teased you know, the, the the fans were like, okay. They didn't know who it was. 
I will say though, I think she's pretty good. I think she's she's very very good. I think she's better than um, the majority of the knockouts right now. And maybe that's blasphemous. Maybe some of you guys are, oh, what are you talking about? I thought um, I thought Tane and Paxley looked pretty good. We knew Jordan was going to win this thing. She did. Uh, I was into it. I was into the match. But but when Tatum Paxley came out, like she was getting booed. They were cheering, we want Tessa. So when when Tatum Paxley came out after she got no pop or no reaction whatsoever, then then they were booing her. And it wasn't booing like, hey, you're a heel. It's kind of like, wow, this is who you gave us. I, I told you guys, whether it's someone from NXT or not, I mean, at one point, I did think maybe it's Natty Neidhart. I was th- I was shooting pretty high at one point, but then as the weeks pass, I start saying lower your expectations. NXT, WWE are not sending their top guys over. Now we know that AJ Styles is going to wrestle Marafuji Pro Wrestling Noah, so you know, hey, maybe down the maybe Slam version, maybe Bound for Glory, we get a big name. We're not getting a big name for against all odds. And the reason I thought Natty Nightheart is because I was I was out of the loop. I thought she was out of her contract at the time at the time. So I was like, well, she's a free agent, why wouldn't she do this? Why wouldn't she show up, you know? Uh, but they did they did kind of change course here and they did actually use someone from NXT, but it was exactly who they teased. I've already talked about after the match what happened with Ash by Elegance. They had an opportunity to get heat on her and they completely shit the bed. I mean, I just can't communicate enough how out I am on Ash and about giving a shit about this match with Jordan Grace. I am so freaking out. Um, oh, and for this match, Ash was ringside. You know, the personal concierge yell, yells, bring her a chair. Frank the Goof shows up two seconds later with a chair. Just bad. Um you know, Tatum Paxley hit this move. They call it the lobotomy, a second rope neck breaker. Very impressive. Very impressive. She's good. I saw her wrestle in, in AEW for a little bit. I didn't really care about her there. She was wrestling Britt Baker, who was a baby face at the time. And, you know, she she did a little AEW stuff, but um, she, she I think, didn't make the pandemic cuts because of she was in the UK or, or whatever. When they were making cuts during the pandemic, they said, hey, you UK people, don't come back. But I, w- I was pretty impressed with her. She's pretty good in the ring. She's hot. Like, it works. And then we get the main event. It was crazy that w- that was the semi-main. Main event, Moose versus Matt Hardy. I wrote here, Daniel Spencer is the only referee, referee that doesn't look like a total goof on screen. He's the only, like, just normal looking dude, not making stupid facial expressions. I think he's the lead. He's the lead ref. Yeah, he, he he's pretty good. When I found out this was broken rules, I stopped caring. I, I don't know if I even cared leading up to this. This is an issue I have with broken Matt. I haven't said this in a really long time. Is that when when he repackaged himself once upon a time, I felt that he needed to repackage his move set as well. So, as an example, once upon a time when Cody Rhodes became Stardust, he he changed half of his move set. They were versions of his Cody Rhodes stuff, but he he really flipped it on us and he just came up with a new move set. And once upon a time when Matt Hardy wrestled for the first time on Impact after doing some broken stuff, I don't remember who he was wrestling. I was like, he's still doing the same side effect and the same man. Everything's the same. And that is the one thing I think is missing a little bit from his character. I think he was biting people. But aside from that, I thought he needed some some new offense to not be doing the same, oh, you know, with, with the fingers and the, you know, the second rope leg drop and the freaking side effect and the twist of fate. I thought he just needed a new move set and that didn't happen. And I, I forgot that I had said that until I was watching this match and he was just doing all the regular Matt Hardy moves. Uh, Rebby Hardy came out at one point. Uh, they an, an immediately sent the Nemeth brothers out to dispatch the system, but Alicia stayed there. Uh, at one point she broke up one of the, one of the 
pinfalls with the kendo stick. Rebby Hardy came out, who I, I mentioned looks amazing. Uh, she came out. She no sold a kendo stock, kendo stick shot to the stomach, uh, and then ends up hitting a twist of fate on Alicia Edwards, where she does a pretty good job with that. I wouldn't have worn those like platform shoes or whatever she had on uh, if she's going to come out and, and and wrestle and take bumps. But you know, I'm not her, obviously. Um, but uh, excuse me, something just popped up on my screen here. But yeah, she kind of no no sells this. Um, that's what the women are doing on this show. No selling foreign, foreign objects. Uh, hits a twist of fate. And then there's the angle after this. It, it's all garbage match. There, there's nothing to review. It's all garbage match wrestling. I did pop for Moose putting on the, the helmet and getting backdropped. <laughs> like he was going to tackle him and then gets backdropped over the top rope. I, I popped for that. actually thought it was funny. But other than that, it, it's, it's garbage wrestling. There's an angle that you could see a mile away at the end, and it's Rebby Hardy standing next to the table. And Matt was going to spear Moose through the table. Moose pulls Rebby in the way, and she goes through the table. So we're kind of back to the wife crutch. You know, uh, they do it with Josh Alexander, and I've, I've said it many times when in doubt, like bring the wife out. Um, so Rebby Hardy goes through the table, and she's, she's standing on her feet by the end of this. She's selling a little bit, but. Then at that point, Moose hits a spear. He gets the win. He retains the championship. And then they do what they do every single time one of these motherfuckers wrestle. It's a beatdown after the match. What was not like really logical to me was, remember, the Nemeth brothers and the system, by the system, I mean Eddie Edwards and, and I was going to say Matt Hardy, but, um, Brian Myers. There's an angle during this match where they the Nemeth brothers run out they dispatch these guys and they're backstage fighting. What happened backstage that all of a sudden Brian Myers and Eddie were able to run out by themselves? Did the mat did the, the brawl end backstage? You know, where they split up and just put in separate corners and had nothing to do with each other the rest of the night. But they come running out, and then the Demeth brothers run out. It just it, it almost seems like a formula that they can't get away from. But then the music hits and the rumors are true. True, Jeff Hardy comes out and Jeff Hardy gets a reaction from this crowd, a pop from this crowd that we have not heard on TNA programming in a long, long, long time. This couldn't have been laid out any better. The react, you know, you couldn't ask for a better reaction from the crowd. And that Jeff comes out, he does his little twist of fate stunner, his swanton that's that hits about, you know, he hits about 10% of it, much like Ash. But the people went crazy for this. Matt is a star, but Jeff Hardy's a huge star. The people love this. And um, it's exciting that now we, we get these guys back because that was a big loss once upon a time. You know, they're a lot older now, but it was a big loss for TNA once upon a time. And now we, you know, maybe we see some really good shit with these guys. And it, in, you know, earlier when I said, hey, I think the tag team title match is going to be the system versus ABC because they're pointing out they got their contractually obligated rematch. I thought it was going to be system versus ABC versus EY and um, Josh Alexander. But now I'm like, well, maybe it's a system versus the Hardys. Maybe it's a system versus the Hardys and the Nemeth brothers. Like there's there's actually a lot of possibilities within this tag team division right now and what they can do at Slammiversary. I'm. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a multi-team match, but there are some possibilities for both multi-team and two-on-two that are kind of interesting. I think the system are going to lose the belts one way or another. If they wrestle the Nemeth brothers again, they're going to lose the belts. If they're going to wrestle the Hardys, they're definitely losing the belts. Because I think they really want to put some kind of title on Nick Nemeth. So that's why I don't know what they're going to do, but it's actually kind of interesting with the tag team division right now. But you could not book this any better for, for what happened at the end of the night with Jeff Hardy. It, it came off great on television. Uh, I'd laugh because Rebby Hardy was trying to sell the, the table shot and Jeff took her arm and held it up in victory. <laughs> I'm curious, um, knockouts-wise, if they're going to do Alicia versus Rebby Hardy. 
it might be the worst match in wrestling history, but um, Rebby can wrestle. If you guys don't know that, she's not a train like she's probably not training to wrestle, but she can wrestle. She was a wrestler at one point, so it's going to be interesting to see if they do that. Um, there's probably going to be kendo sticks and shit involved, but uh, even though it won't be good, I'm like kind of interested in it as well. Like I, I want to see it. Maybe Rebby Hardy has a ta- finds a tag team partner to take on Militia and <laughs> I'm calling her the the I'm calling them the Militia, um, Masha and Lisha. Maybe that's what happens. You know, maybe it's uh, Killer Kelly. Like it, there's actually some interesting things that can uh, stem from this whole system, uh, mixing it up with the Hardys with the Nemeth brothers. There's it's it's really interesting. Uh, it's probably going to be, it's probably going to save the show because I don't think there's anything interesting going on elsewhere. There's some, I think we're going to get some good matches, whatever, but from a creative standpoint, this is, this is where it's, it's really interesting. And the good part about it is that it does feature the world champion, the tag team champions, and one of the knockouts champions. So it, it, the opportunity for some compelling stuff to be, um, for certain, Compelling angles to involve championships. The opportunities there. So we could get some really good TV for the rest of the year. Not for the rest of the year, but rest of the build up to Slammiversary. So it's going to be very, very interesting. That is going to do it for me, guys. I'm your boy, BQ. We're talking against all odds. Uh, thanks for riding with me all this time. And we're going to see what happens on this upcoming episode of Impact. So we should see Jeff Hardy and we should just see some. We should see some interesting things. I'm actually very interested in it. We'll see you soon. Peace.